Hello, welcome to Midwest Fish Finder Episode 2. We have a great show. We have Dr. Ted Burgess on, and he's going to talk about insects and how to use hatches to improve your trout game. And the, co the conversation starts now. Welcome back. So before we introduce our guests, I want to just do a real quick stream report for January. We, we have been on the, the trout streams. I've actually been on the trout streams with uh, Dr. Ted a couple of times. And we're catching fish. We're not catching a lot of numbers. But you definitely can on the warmer days. Just remember uh, the colder water temps, and especially with the snow we've got with the melt, probably going to cool down the water temps. But it will actually you can catch some fish it's just not going to be a lot of numbers but we we have caught some browns and we've caught a few rainbows and some and dave's caught some brooks so it is possible so get, if you get a chance on a warmer day sneak out to southwest wisconsin or south central wisconsin and hop on a trout stream and and give it a go uh like dave always says you gotta go to know so check it out Hope you have a good time, and anytime you want, hop on MidwestFishFinder.com. You can always check on our reports and see what we're up to. I'm doing a really good job this year of keeping up the reports. So, without further ado, we have Dr. Ted Burgess. He is an entomologist. He's a Ph.D. Uh, adjunct professor at NIU, correct? Uh, an academic advisor to the undergraduates in the biology department and also a, a research associate right research. now as well, yes. Okay. And man, he's a he's we we started trout fishing probably about the same time, and this guy has become an incredible trout fisherman. Uh, I've done a lot of adventures with him. The one fly tournament where he led our team, the Creek Chubs, uh, with the most points, uh, which was a lot of fun. Pull up a few pictures from the one fly tournament. We had a blast. It was it was way more fun than I would expected. And Dr. Ted, he's taught me a lot about entomology, so I'm glad to have him on the show. Dr. Ted, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. All right. So why entomology? What got you hooked on insects? Oh, uh, man, I have liked them since I was a little kid. I mean, three, four years old, you can... Uh, you can talk to my mom she has a million stories about me playing in the backyard we used to have this rock wall along our garage uh, when I lived in Naperville way way back and uh, I used to just spend all morning I'd get up go out there and just turn rocks over pick pick anything up and everything up you know stick things in my pocket that I shouldn't have and and uh, just always that was like every day I would do that um, just religiously so they've always just been a thing for me and and uh, you know later later on in life I, I learned I could turn it into a profession and and here I am so which came first entomology or fly fishing oh entomology definitely came first and then uh, the the fishing thing I've always you know I've been a fisherman since I was I was young uh, the entomology thing definitely came first, though, uh, I guess. In, in terms of loving insects, uh, that definitely came first. But started tr fishing, you know, traditional fishing, and, and uh, fly fishing just kind of, you know, took hold. It was kind of married to the entomology thing. It was a natural progression for me, and, uh, yeah, just was no looking back from there. And there's different, so when you, you study entomology, there's different, spe uh, where you get into a specific branch of entomology right and mm -hmm. you're in 
Uh, okay, so I guess you would call, I'd call myself an applied entomologist, um, and I work primarily in medical and veterinary entomology. Uh, so those are insects of um, agricultural, livestock, and public health concern. Um, so that includes things like uh, filth flies, mosquitoes, ticks, um, you know, any kind of agricultural pest, really. Um, and then I do a lot of toxicology work. Um, I do consulting for uh, statistics for companies. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, pretty well entrenched in all that stuff. But that's what I would consider, you know, if you had to call myself a certain type of field in entomology, that's what it would be. And then you started using your entomology, your knowledge in entomology to improve your trout game. And so how, how did you go about that? Well, I mean, the most important part is knowing their life cycle um, and knowing that uh, a very, very large part of a trout and really any fish's diet is going to be uh, aquatic macroinvertebrates, uh, which is the fancy term for water insects, basically, or the larval or nymphal stages of, um, of insects uh, that live in, in aquatic environments. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's... And so, for you, picking up the hatches and, and figuring that out comes pretty easy, but for somebody like me who's like a streamer stripper, I love just the strip streamers, but I think I can improve my game by just learning some basic entomology how would you get how would you tell somebody like me to get started like what how do you approach a stream to find out what could possibly be a uh, insect that would be a food source uh the number one thing you know without any any extra equipment or anything like that is just dipping your hand in the water and turning over rocks and seeing you know what's crawling underneath there and uh you know the the very basics. You'll you know you'll almost always see some stage of caddis fly uh, all year long. There's there's uh, you know with the exception of the er very early months, there's almost always consistently a caddis hatch going on, or they're at least in a a, a stage where they're very visible on the rocks. Um, you see a lot of mayflies uh, all year long at different stages. Um, depending on the year, uh, the time of year, um, it can be stoneflies. Like right now, we're seeing a lot of stoneflies, black winter stoneflies um, on the bottoms of the rocks. You'll find scuds all year long. Um, you know, we start to get into yellow sallies into the early part of the year. Um, you know, those are the main ones that we really, we really see. And so you... You, now we've identified, okay, you, you go in, you flip some rocks, you kind of identify some insects. But to be able to catch the fish, you have to trick them. So there, there's pieces to that. There's presentation, there's matching the color and the size and the silhouette of the fly. C could you rank those for me for like a beginner saying, hey, what's most important when you're uh, presenting your fly to the the fish to get a successful strike i would say probably more than anything it's size with color probably being very closely uh closely associated with that afterwards um, unlike a lot of the streams out west where you know you really do have to match super super tight to um whatever's kind of their main thing is that they're keying in on um i don't tend to feel like we have that much of a of a pressure for that in the midwest um but still depending on the the quality you know the the clarity of the creek and really how much pressure is on the creek you know there's a lot of these creeks the the legendary ones up there you always hear about that are just pounded and you know everyone there's one of those creeks that i was on once that i re i remember uh walking up to this bridge and this guy was coming down and he was just watching me you know fish the first riffle and i had some kind of small streamer on at the time and he's just watching me watching me and i was you know pulling a couple of fish here and there out of this riffle and he walks up and asked me what i was fishing and i said you know i'm it's a little woolly bugger or something like that and he just laughed at me and said well you're the first person today i've seen that's not throwing an olive scud and that's just kind of a testament to you know 
that people, when you hear about what flies work on certain creeks, everyone pounds those flies, and eventually they stop working. Yeah. Um, I mean, even John Bethke, the inventor of the famed pink squirrel, has uh, you know started altering the way that he ties that fly because it's become such a popular po- popular way to 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 fish. Right. So, um, what for a beginner? You you open a fly magazine and you look at these trout flies and there's just hundreds and hundreds of them and it just seems overwhelming especially if you don't really have a deep understanding of entomology how to pick the flies for your water we talked about identifying some of the insects but mostly in in southwest wisconsin what what would you say would be your top five flies to use and why um i guess probably in order um if I had to rank them from like first being my number one fly to five being still a great fly, but you know, I'd go through the first four um, before that one would be um, probably a small bugger or my, my VIB that I always throw um, in different sizes, different weights. You know, it really depends on where they're at. If they're holding real deep in slow water, you throw something big with tungsten on it. If they're up in the fast stuff, you know, a smaller fly might be a better choice. Or if it's a very clear creek, uh, you know, water is very uh, real high visibility. You might want to be throwing something that's a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter, that maybe will trick them a little bit. Um, that that flashy stuff can tend to be um, alarming to them in those really clear creeks like that. Uh, so a bugger would be number one. Uh, I'd probably put the pink squirrel at number two. Um, I like to tie it on a uh, a jig hook with a tungsten bead so that it really ticks bottom and I don't ever uh, hit the hook get the hook buried in any of the, the rocks or anything kind of under the surface. Um, a scud, really any kind of scud. There's a, the Cooley scud, which is a, a homegrown design up in the, from the Driftless Angler. That's a phenomenal pattern. Um, and other, other than that, just like a gray scud, you know, a dark hairsier gray scud is a great fly. Um, I know you and I both love the San Juan worm. Um, that one works phenomenally well uh really at any time there's been days where that's the only thing i've been able to catch fish on and then my personal favorite for um when dry start going even when there isn't a hatch going on just when you're when it's starting to get active on the top an elk hair caddis or some variant of it my personal favorite's a cdc uh, caddis so the the san juan worm i got a great story about the san juan worm when i very my very first i think it was my very first uh trip up to southwest wisconsin and fishing and i i was throwing everything that i had in my box into the water and i couldn't couldn't catch my first brown ever and i happened to glance over and i saw this guy with some spinning gear and he was catch he was catching fishing he was catching some decent sized browns so I was like, you know what? I got to suck up my pride. I'm going to go over there. And I asked him, I was like, hey, what are, what are you doing? And what he was doing was taking a worm and he was breaking it in half and using like a half a worm, put it on his hook, and he was bouncing it on the bottom and he was having great success. So I opened up my fly box and I had that San Juan and I said, do you think this San Juan, this worm would work? He goes, yeah, I would give it a shot. And then he gave me some pointers on where to go up to like where a riffle was and sure enough that was my very first round was on the san juan worm and that we've had some great days with the san juan worm out there um so that's a testament to the san juan worm and i was on a creek just recently and it had a, a mud bank and i accidentally stepped on the edge and some of it crumbled out and i happened to see worms come out of the of the dirt and Mm -hmm. so that kind of makes sense to me now so especially when you get some rain and get a little bit of stain and get some of that wash out that san juan's going to come but as far as dry fly fishing switching gears um it dry fly fishing is very challenging uh i've been on some some really clear creeks and and with dave and, and you and um when you when presentation is important but what would you recommend like what would be the best starter dry fly and why uh really depends on the season i mean the first if you really want to get your feet wet on dry fly fishing 
um, and you have you know a, a very forgiving uh, first uh, foray into dry fly fishing would probably be one of the the caddis hatches in the early spring, the early to mid spring. So starting in April and going through you know May really is the the heavy um, tan and black caddis hatches. Um, from there, there's always constant caddis hatches going on they just aren't quite as thick and pronounced as as that early spring um and then that would be the way that you know if you wanted to first get into dry fly fishing that would be the way i would do it uh it's pretty pretty forgiving the patterns don't have to be super nice and clear the nice thing about caddis is what they're part of their um, biology is that the females will have an egg sac hanging off the back of them and they will drag it on the, the water, basically using the, uh, the water tension to pull the egg sac off of them as they fly by. And so they skip along the surface. Um, so having a little bit of drag while you're, um, while you're fishing a, a caddis, it's not that bad because they may end up making those wakes anyways just by virtue of trying to uh, release that egg sac. So fish will sometimes key in on them more if they're twitching or leaving a little bit of a wake than if they're just dead drifting. Um, and that, you know, if you're not good with mending yet, if you're not good at, you know, controlling your line going upstream or at like a three quarters upstream yet, uh, it's a good way. And the fish, they are just possessed at that time of year i mean they're that you won't be able to just hit anything at all you know that whole morning and then when they start coming up at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and there's just clouds of them they just turn into great white sharks and you know you just almost every cast you, you get them I, I do know that when that hatch happens because i i've sent you pictures of like hey what's this and it was that black caddis and I was actually stripping a leech pattern, and I had success until the hatch came, and mm -hmm. then it turned off for the, the for the leech pattern mm -hmm. altogether. So I think it is important to be able. That's why I'm so interested in entomology and learning some of this is because um, there will be times where the patterns I go to they don't work, and I have to figure, I have to punt, and I have to you know figure something else out. And so that's why I'm so interested in this um, with the. How important is the, the life cycle of the insect and, and knowing, okay, the different stages, how important is that to fly fishing? Well, I mean, you, you read anybody who's, you know, started to get into fly fishing has read somewhere at some point that the majority of fish feed below the surface. So the dry fly, fly fishing thing has really been romanticized and for good reason. I mean, when you catch a good, a good hatch and you've got the right fly on the right creek and, you know, everything's clicking... There's nothing else like it. I mean, there's a reason people get addicted to that because it is truly a, a unique and sensational way to fish. Um, but that sadly can't be all the time. And we still want to catch fish even on days where there aren't hatches or, um, you know, you're not keyed in or whatever. Um, so it's very, very important to know the life cycle and specifically, uh, you know, matching flies that are... Um, are pertinent to the the midwest and the driftless area as a whole uh you know there are there are patterns regional patterns everywhere you know you go to the white or the little red river you've got the um what is that fly called the red something uh they have um crest bugs and um, scuds that they fish all the time down there uh, you know, there's just kind of locally named patterns. Um, and we have ours, you know, the pink squirrel and, uh, there's the Fricks fix and mm. things like that, that are kind of unique to our area. Yep. Uh, but there's, you know, learning, learning what patterns kind of imitate those main insects that are, are under the surface is important. So if you see like a hatch just beginning say you see but say you see a black um a, a, a black cast and you you see it but you don't see any rising fish how can you use the life cycle to determine what you're going to do to to catch the fish subsurface i mean is it do you go to a nymph do you go to a merger because it be a merger or you know explain some of that of what you go through in that process yeah that's a that's a, a good um that's a really good question. So um, if you don't see rises, 
you know, you see rise forms of swirls sometimes. It really depends. You know, if it's just a swirl, it means that they're probably hitting something that's emerging, which is the aquatic phase of the insect starting to form a little bubble. Their wing pads have fully matured, and they're starting to use that bubble to then rise up the surface uh, and then eventually break the, the water tension and fly off and complete their life cycle, which is mainly mating when they, when they uh, turn into adults. And um, so you see swirling, you don't really see fish rising, you don't see fish splashing, you don't see heads, noses poking out. It's probably time for an emerger. Um, and an emerger, you can fish that at all different levels. There are people who tie emergers with beads and use lead and get them to the bottom. There's people that swing them. You know, that's kind of what a soft tackle is designed to look like. Um, when it's actually on the surface, that's when you want to throw the dry on. And when you are subsurface and you're not seeing swirls, but you're turning rocks over and you're seeing caddis, you know, stuck to the rocks left and right, that's when you're going to want to tie on something that looks like, a, you know, a rock worm or you can even get away with things like uh, hare's ears, nymphs, um, you know, anything that kind of looks buggy and that grayish kind of color that, that they tend to be, um, that's going to work. That's an interesting point um, that you make. So when you, uh, you flip over the rocks and you determine uh, what... You mentioned the hairs there. Are there certain patterns that you can kind of use, like as you know, search patterns that will help you kind of key in, or can uh, was it mimic multiple insects? Uh, the two big ones for me, you know, outside of the the kind of regionals, just mm -hmm. the the generic flies that you know anybody can get from any catalog, or they can, yeah. everybody learns the tie at, at the very beginning of fly tying. The two that I've always had tons of success with, and this was before I really even knew much about fly fishing uh i always like a dark hair's ear nymph with a the gold rib like the classic but i don't like i don't like the brown i like it with like a dark hair's ear like almost like a real dark gray that almost looks black in the water i love that pattern brush it out real brushy um i'll throw that in a 14 or a 16 and then um just a regular uh pheasant tail you know, size 16 pheasant tail with a brass bead and a little bit of split shot on it that you're gonna you're gonna catch fish on any creek anywhere with that fly guaranteed and so i mean do you do like um you you run two two flies on your rig sometimes or when you're searching and trying to figure things out yeah almost always almost always it's a two fly rig unless i'm throwing a streamer um and even then sometimes two streamers or a nymph or a San Juan or something off the shank of a streamer or, you know, whatever works. Uh, but, yeah, so usually it'll be a, a heavier fly on the front and a lighter fly on the back so you don't get that tension. Yeah. Uh, and that, um, that's kind of also what split shot is designed to do. It's to kind of make that fulcrum or that, that pivot point, uh, so not the, the fly. You, so the, the, the very last fly is just barely above the bottom of the surface, but it's not actually dragging on the bottom. It's kind of floating. Exactly right, yep. Very interesting. Um, so can we, can we walk through, like, from January kind of, you know, I know you don't have all the hatch charts memorized around here, but you have fished a lot of these creeks in both in south-central Wisconsin all the way in Grant and Crawford and uh, was it Vernon County, all up through there. Um, so in January, I noticed we saw um, the couple times we have went together, we saw a couple sparse midge hatches. Mm -hmm. But what else can we find like in the winter for, for hatches? So the main thing you'll get is midges, which are, uh, are, are um, flies. They're dipterans, uh, and they are... Uh, uh, family Chironomidae. Um, those are non-biting midges as opposed to the noceums that, you know, everyone who's up there at some point will experience. Uh, those are similar, uh, similar uh, in, the, in the same general family, I guess. Uh, not technically, uh, I guess scientifically, they are Ceratopogonidae family, Ceratopogonidae. So uh, they're, they're relatives, put it that way. And uh, Unlike Chironomidae, which do not blood feed, 
uh, Ceratopaconidae obviously does, and they bite, and they're not fun to be bitten yeah. by. And deal pastures with. are no good in the summer. No, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Unless you got a head net. Or what yeah. Would you get? Yeah, I have a head. I have a head net now, and then you use, you know, the Driftless Angler always uh, recommends a, a product called Buggins, which yeah. is a non uh, non pesticide, uh, non DEET. And that, that's important. Explain why you don't want to use a deep product. Yeah, so deep products you don't want to use uh, because fly lines that are not uh, urethane-based fly lines uh, will uh, will be eaten by it. Deet is a strong organic solvent, um, so it'll it'll eat through your fly lines if they're if they're PVC. So, so we talked about and winter stoneflies, right? Or, or possible you can get lucky and catch a winter yes, stonefly hatch yes you can you can get lucky on a warm a warm day you might find a sparse uh, uh winter stonefly little black winter stonefly hatch um but you know they aren't surprisingly from my experience you know being around these you know our local waters in the kish and and then also up there um the kish at times has just clouds of winter stoneflies emerge more than I've seen up in the driftless area. And that's very interesting. Cause I, I've always wanted to, I listen to a lot of, um, Harry Murray. He's a, a, a phenomenal, he has a great podcast and, um, he talk, he does, he, he nymphs for small mouths. Mm-hmm. So one of these days we're going to have to really put our heads together and really make an effort to use some winter stoneflies and actually try to catch small mouth on winter stoneflies. I really think, I think it's possible, especially like, Super early spring, right? Might be a good time. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I, more about trout. So then we kind of go into when's the, when's the black um, caddis hatch start? I know you nailed it a bunch of times last year and had really, really good success. When, when does that kind of start and when can people get ready for that type of hatch? It's the the black and tan kind of overlap each other, and those usually start anywhere from early April, you know, to end of April, and then they kind of they kind of peter off, you know. They don't really. It's not really a start and a stop. It's not like yellow sallies where you get them, you know, at a very specific time of year, and then they're gone. Um, with the black and tan caddis, uh, they start to pop, you know, and sometime in April. And they they go pretty strong through April. They go pretty strong through May, and then they start to taper off around June. Uh, doesn't mean that they're gone. It just means that you know you're not going to be getting clouds of them at ten or eleven o'clock in the morning like you do in April and May. With those with those larger hatches, and I mean there was there was th- th- that black cat's hatch that I caught in in Grant County, and I was, I took pictures of it. It was just swarms of them, and. <clears throat> It, it seems to me it's almost uh, luck of the draw when you th- throw your fly in there. Of if they're going to eat your fly or the hundred other caddis right around your fly. Um, what, what do you, I mean? Is there something you can do to make yourself more successful? Is there a location to throw your fly to make your your drift more successful and get a better chance? Uh, two things. One, um, where you see a lot of flies on the surface, that is the natural is the real thing. Um, casting somewhere on the, the boundaries of where they are. So either way downstream where they start to get a little thinner out or a little upstream or a little to the right or a little to the left. Uh, tends to be a good spot. Um, fish will key in on those stragglers and hit those. Um, another really good thing is... Um, a lot of those fish, a lot of the really excited fish are sitting in the riffles, catching the emergers as they come up, and they're just sitting waiting for anything. So casting up on the riffles a really, really good strategy, especially if you're a beginner, because there's so many little microcurrents and stuff going on that they're really not paying any attention to drag on your fly line or anything like that. They just see that silhouette moving fast past them, and they just they just hammer it. And sometimes, you know, the faster water, they have to react faster yes. because the food just flies by them. Yep. So they're either going to go or not, and they don't get time to inspect it, you know, kind of drift with the fly and inspect it. Um, so what what else? So going on the, the black caddis, uh, what type of, because, I mean, I want to catch one of these hatches, and really I've not had a successful black caddis hatch uh, experience yet. And 
What type of conditions in the creek do you look for? I remember when we were fishing together, you were pointing out certain sections that there was characteristics about the stream that made it really, um, you said, this is where they're going to be. This is where you, when the, the black cast is going to hatch, this is where you want to come and fish. What characteristics of the stream are you talking about? Are you looking at? Anywhere that's really rocky, um, anywhere that you're going to have any kind of, you know, a mild speed run or a riffle, you know, that's not like a big dumping, huge, powerful riffle. Anything where there's some moving water where, you know, you can really aggressively throw flies, slap the water, stuff like that. It's really a pretty aggressive dry fly fishing technique for caddis because they're such an active uh, organism. They really are. They, they fly all over the place, you know, flit up and down, slap at the water, pick up, you know, drag all along the water, swim upstream, you know, against the, 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 the current. They're, they're very, very active um, uh, organisms. And so uh, picking out those types of spots where there's a lot of that good rocky bottom, with some fast moving, you know, not super fast, but right. moving water nearby. And then the most important thing is lies, where fish yeah. can just lie and wait and just catch things. Little areas that, you know, uh, narrow down in the creek where it gets fast water and then opens up, they're going to sit in all those little areas because that's just a little conveyor belt dumping food right, into their right. mouth, basically. So those are the type of areas you want to you wanna watch out for. Um, and you know you you fish those hatches you know two or three times you just get to a good feeling of where they're going to be what what the what that hatch water looks like so i'm definitely going to have to well we're going to talk about the one fly at the end of this a little bit cuz we're going to put a team together so i definitely want to hop on and and catch some of these cast experiences with you but um, another thing i want to talk about is well in the summertime we're we're all about smallmouth and um we we get up there, but it it's like a like you said the what they call the biting midges, those will eat you alive. So it's kind of challenging up there sometimes. But towards the end of the summer, terrestrials, right? Oh, so yeah. that's a great talk about terrestrials. What what um, types of terrestrials have been successful for you? Well, that was the very first brown trout that I ever caught. That was the the trip that oh, you right. and I yep. took up there. I we that. we took that up to Grant County and uh, camped for a whole weekend and just fished. And we thought we thought we were you know <laughs> kings of the world because <laughs> I think to come... yeah that night was great because we at first I mean that it was some challenging water because at first we spooked a lot of fish, but then once it started getting the sun started to go down a little bit. That is, um, there's a shadow in the water, and all of a sudden fish started rising. I remember this experience; it was great. But what what fly were you using? That was just a foam beetle that yeah. I had tied. I had just gotten into tying, and I knew that you know just looking at like the driftless angular, one yeah. of the the main flies, and I was like, oh, you know, everyone says a beetle pattern works up there, so I just tied some generic beetle patterns, and we were on a little creek where it already started getting just eaten alive by the the no -seums. we got up into this woody section where there was a riffle and we saw fish smack in the surface it was almost too dark to see and i dropped that right on that riffle and yeah that fish came up and took it that was a great night and not only that um the great thing about that experience is we, we trade um i remember trading rods back and forth yes. and we caught several fish out of that one Yep. Riffle, that one ripple that dumped into that run. Yep. Uh, so it, that's a that's such a great experience. Um, so terrestrials can be really great, right? You can, uh, as far as like getting big fish, what do you think? You know, terrestrials. Oh, is, hoppers. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there are some creeks. Any of the creeks, a good rule of thumb would be, any creek that you see that has the long, tall grass that's laying in the water, and is still wide enough to cast on. Uh, those are the creeks that you're going to want to be fishing beetles and ants and especially grasshoppers. Do you have a favorite hopper pattern? My personal favorite uh, hopper pattern isn't one that is, at least that I've seen, is very commonly used up there, and that's the Schroeder's hopper. I like it because it's almost, it is all natural um, materials. There's no foam on it or anything like that. And I just find that the way the water kind of soaks into that fly and the way that fly lays on the surface they're just i've caught so many big fish on that and they just absolutely annihilate it so um 
What's your take about, this is kind of on the subject, but off the subject a little bit, is with these dry flies, people put in like um, different colors like purple, you know, like the purple hippie stomper. Uh, we used the, the red and black one. Yes. And that, we had good success with it. In fact, I remember we were frustrated for a minute. That fish was rising and we threw that hippie stomper up there and sure enough, that, that worked. But now I see people, in fact, um, I've seen purple atoms. I've mm -hmm. seen purple... Um, uh, the the purple hippie stomper. We, I mean, I don't. What is that? So that kind of throws the color thing off. What is that? What is it? I mean, is that just because purple looks like something different, or what do you think about that? It's an attractor. You know, it's an attractor color. They they see in a different uh, wavelength than yeah. we see. So different. You know, a purple color doesn't necessarily mean that it looks purple to them. Right. Um, and uh, it's all, I mean, if you think about purple, it's pretty close to black. It's just kind of right. Or, or, yeah. So. Right. Well, but especially browns. I mean, you always hear, it doesn't really matter where you go. You go out west, you go out east. You know, purple tends to work. Pink works. Blue works a lot of places. You know, real bright colors that you're not going to really see in any of their their food sources. And it's, you know, partly it's just that reaction strike that yeah. you're getting. You're getting something flashy that they just yeah. instinctively go at. All right. So, man, we're... We've been talking 30 minutes already, and I, I want to talk about the one fly before we end this because the one fly, like I said, was such a great experience. We're going to put another team together, right, mm -hmm. this year? Mm -hmm. um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about the one fly? They haven't drawn, uh, haven't drawn teams yet, but uh, when is it this year? This is uh, it's going to be on March 31st. Um, it's up in Viroqua. Uh, it's being put on by Peter Kozad, the uh, head guide at the Driftless Angler. Um, super nice guy. He knows the area so well. He's a just a wizard of a fly fisherman. Um, just he's always willing to give advice. You know, tell you spots, tell you flies. He's you know he's been a, a super cool guy to talk to and and get to know over the the past couple of years. Um, really, everybody at the Driftless Angler though, uh, yeah. Matt and Jerry are also yeah. they help put on this tournament. It's a fundraiser. Um, all the proceeds go to various um, charities and, and causes to uh, get kids into fishing. Yeah. Um, so it's a really worthy cause. Uh, it's a ton of fun. You know, it's not meant to be super competitive but right. you know we all do this because this is hard mode fishing you know right. fly fishing's hard mode fishing everyone's got some pride in this right and it gets right. fun and friendly competitive yeah. but yeah man it's it is it's yeah. intense and fun yeah yeah so i'm, de I'm definitely stoked stoked about the tournament this year um i think we got a good there's been some changes to the rules i think that's going to play to our wheelhouse a little bit oh, yeah. better because uh, we tend to really target a little bit bigger browns um and we love to strip streamers and kind of you, you're you're looking for you're not going to get as many fish stripping streamers but you're going to get some quality fish for mm -hmm. sure so i'm excited for that that's on my birthday march 31st is it nice yeah so uh, we gotta do good top, yeah top five this year we gotta try oh, yeah. top five we finished middle of the pack last year and which was fun because it was a learning experience i think we we um, could have made some decisions to uh, improve our success with switching to another creek. We could have done that faster and maybe because we did have success once we went to the other creek. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited for that. So, Ted, it's been great. I mean, I learned tons and tons from you. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to have you back on the mm -hmm. show of course. because this is just intro just the barely intro into entomology but there's there's people that fly fish that really are into it as deep as you that really like to learn you know the latin names and i think you can come back and even teach us more you know like what is the life cycle and and mm -hmm. that stuff i think so let's think about that in you know like maybe in uh the end of the summer because we'll be fishing terrestrials by yeah then, that's so a good sure. idea um so all right everybody i hope you enjoyed the show and if you want to uh follow this channel just go ahead and subscribe below there will be a subscribe button and like always check out midwestfishfinder.com that way you there's all types of maps and resources we post fishing reports to and we're going to keep those up to date really good this year and if you're interested in, you know, grabbing a guided trip for smallmouth or something of that nature, 
hop on to www.midwestfishingadventures.com. Fill out the form. I'll get back to you in 24 hours. So everybody have a great night. Oh, wait, one thing before I go. We have a really, really another good guest, man. We had great guests already, Dave and Ted, this year. We have Dustin Hines coming up on the first Tuesday in March, 7 p.m., to talk musky on the fly, and this guy is amazing, uh, musky fisherman. I learned a lot from him. I'm so blessed to be around these guys and learn a lot about fly fishing. So you don't want to miss the next show. He's he's going to be a great guest, and we might talk a little bit about uh, the hardly strictly musky tournament. I think uh, I might be going down there with Dustin to fish that tournament. So we're trying to get that lined up. All right, have a great night. Please subscribe and leave some comments and give us some feedback. Thanks. Have a good night.